Fractured families are a common theme throughout the Final Fantasy series. The majority of the franchise's characters either come from one parent families or have lost both of their parents along the way. It's not just a Final Fantasy trope, it's a storytelling trope. The lack of parents adds a certain layer of mystique to a character. It creates empathy for that individual, puts more of a focus on them and makes them stronger, as they've usually had to fight a lot harder through their life to get to where they are. A character who has lived through grief can conjure up a strength that is rarely displayed by characters who come from happy, stable homes. We could discuss fractured families from the perspective of any of the games, but perhaps the theme weighs heaviest in Final Fantasy VIII, a story which is centred first around a battle school effectively run by children from broken homes, and then later, the orphanage from which they came. Final Fantasy VIII usually gets a bad rap from fans, because it often struggled to recreate the drama and jeopardy of its immediate predecessors. But if you look closer you'll discover some of the darkest world building and scene setting in the entire series. The game goes to great lengths to uproot the traditional family dynamic. Before the story even begins, the Sorcerer's War 17 years ago has drawn blood soaked lines through families. The ramifications are still being felt by the game's main characters in the present day. Squall's mother Rain died young, too young for Squall to remember her, and he has no knowledge of his father. Zell, Selfie, Quistus, Cypher and Irvine are orphans. No information is ever given about their parents. Zell has an adoptive mother, but no adoptive father. There's a theory that Irvine's parents are Mare Dolb and Flo from Fisherman's Horizon. Perhaps they abandoned Irvine for a child-free existence, but still carry around his playing card for sentimental value. Pretty dark stuff. Renault's mother, Julia Hartley, died in a car crash when Renault was very young. Her father, General Carraway, is still alive, but they have a troubled relationship. Carraway leads the Galbadian army while Renault is head of a resistance movement dedicated to opposing Galbadia's military oppression. The rift between them is so great, perhaps, that Renault has even taken to using her mother's maiden name, Hartley. You get the sense that General Carraway has poured his heart and soul into his career while Renoa has taken steps to disassociate herself from her father over the years. By the time Renoa is captured by Esther, it's easy to forget that her father is still out there somewhere. But while Renoa and Squall have tragic backgrounds, none is more heartbreaking than Alone. Alone and her parents live next door to Squall's mother Rain, sometime before Squall was born. At that time, Sorcerer Sadell had begun her desperate search for a worthy successor snatching young girls from their families the world over. When Adele's troops arrived in Windhill, they gunned down Alone's parents, who were trying to protect their child. In a devastating nod to the past, you can still see the bullet holes in the house next door to Rain's bar. A broken home, frozen in time. Alone's crib, her toys, still upstairs. Rain managed to hide Alone from Adele's soldiers, and she decided to adopt the young girl. With the addition of Laguna, Alone enjoyed a happy family home for a while, but that too became a fractured relationship once Laguna disappeared. It's fair to say that family rarely endures in the world of Final Fantasy VIII. Perhaps the most important union in the game is Headmaster Sid and Adia, or Matron, the ultimate foster parents. Matron was a mother figure, the saviour, for almost all of the main characters, but that sacred role is warped when she is possessed by Ultimecia. The characters retrospectively learned that Adia, the enemy they were trying to assassinate, was once Matron, their mother figure. But even after Adia is cleansed of Ultimecia's grip, a large question mark still remains over her, tainting the mother role. The possession of Adia also created a divide between she and Sid for a period of time, with Sid even orchestrating the assassination attempt on his malevolent wife. Sid, as headmaster of Balam Garden, acts as a surrogate father to its students. He, along with Dr. Katawaki, are the only adult figures shown on screen in Garden. Later, Sid even relinquishes control of Garden to Squall, retreating and effectively transferring power from his damaged generation to the new hopeful generation. It's also not lost on me that Sid's sudden abandonment of Garden is akin to a father running away from the established family, though his intentions were pure in this case, in a way echoing Laguna's own abandonment of Rain. Above all else, the story is built on the lines that Squall and Laguna walk. Many years ago, Laguna fell in love with Rain. They married and had a child, whom Laguna never met. He had already left Windhill to rescue alone from the clutches of Sorceress Adele. When Squall first sees Laguna in his dream, he is irritated, 
referencing the awkwardness many children feel for their own parents. Although Laguna is heroic, Squall sees only his flaws. Squall can barely watch Laguna struggle to chat with Julia, ignoring his own frailties in the social skills department, or perhaps being forced to acknowledge them. We often hate the thing that resembles us the most. While an official reconciliation scene between the pair would have been nice, perhaps having Laguna grab Squall and hug or handshake would be a stretch for these characters. Or perhaps a heart-to-heart -heart conversation would undermine the theme of fractured relationships within the game. If such a scene were to exist, Squall would no doubt have questions. Why did you leave? Why didn't you come find me? Being abandoned is like being left in a dark void. Although Squall was trapped in darkness after his battle with Ultimecia, he had really been caught in the void almost his entire life, afraid to accept helping hands for fear he would lose them too, just to be left alone again. We can only assume that Laguna didn't have to endure the kind of upbringing Squall did. Laguna is a more social creature, he has an inquisitive mind, interested in people and places, in forging loyal companions along the way. People gravitate towards him, he inspires a revolution against Adele and even gets elected president of a foreign land. Perhaps a squall with a more traditional upbringing would be more like his father, but with his mother's sensibilities to level him out. Over the course of the story, Headmaster Sid forces Squall into leadership positions, Sid seeing the innate abilities locked within the teenager, which of course only serves to frustrate Squall, who doesn't see himself that way at all. In his mind he is still that frightened orphan child calling out, a remnant of a broken home. There is no definitive point where Squall learns that Laguna is his father, but it's safe to say that he has an unconscious understanding at the very least, and whether inspired by his father's bravery or powered by an inherent drive to destroy this cycle of loneliness, he steps up and becomes that rock for others. He begins to speak his feelings, he discovers his identity, who he is and where he has come from. Laguna's lesson to Squall is to trust friendship to be his guiding light. Lessons from a father from a generation blighted by misery. Family can be found in friendship. Yes, this is a world of broken homes. Against such a backdrop, Squall and Manoa's burgeoning relationship is a seed of hope for the future. Their similarities are striking. Sure, Laguna used to have a thing for Renoa's mother, Julia, but the connection between Squall and Renoa doesn't end there. Both characters have lost their mother young. Both characters have a fractured relationship with their father. Squall's father, Laguna, is in control of Estar, while Renoa's father, General Carraway, with the disposal of Sorceress Adia and President Dilling, has perhaps the most influence over the nation of Galbadia. Together with their children linking, maybe the conflict between the rival nations can finally be put to bed. As the game ends, the world enters a new era, where families can flourish once again. The Sorceress conflict has ended, and so too the spell it had over families the world over.